right, so as promised, we are back to talk a little bit about what we've learned from building a data science capacity within the government and public sector, why it's important, and what are some of the things that we want to share with you so that you can learn and uh, make sure that you maybe don't repeat some of the same mistakes, but then also really can um, be successful going forward. And back to moderate this panel is Jonathan Williams. So Jonathan, as you just saw, is our applied data science lead in our public sector team. Jonathan, take it away. Thank you, Patrice. Uh, you may have just heard me present, so I will only give a bare bones introduction of myself before turning it over to our panelists. I work with local, state, and federal uh, government clients on at Civis to do some of our data science consulting work. And uh, I'm, I mostly want to stay out of the way. I want to ask questions because I have two people who have built data science capacity in government with me on the call. I have Pamela Moreno from the city of Norfolk, and I have Kate Kigongo from the city of West Hollywood. These are in some ways very different cities. West Hollywood's about two square miles, 35,000 people. It's, it's a West Coast city. It's known for its LGBTQ community and its strong progressive values. Norfolk is East Coast, Chesapeake Bay, about 240,000 people, about 53 square miles of land and about 43 more of water, if I recall, uh, known for a large naval base and for a lot of low-lying areas. Uh, that's of course just a few of the facts, but I want to turn it now over uh, first to Kate and then Pamela, just to say a few words of introduction of themselves, their own careers. Kate, why don't you lead off? Great, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Jonathan said, I am Kate Kugongo, Senior Innovation Analyst for the City of West Hollywood. My role focuses on building infrastructure capacity for new technology in our public right of way, as well as building staff capacity for taking on the smart city technologies and innovative problems of the future. So I have a bit of a split brain, both infrastructure and uh, people and organizational change. And I'm happy to talk about uh, data science capacity today. Thanks for having me. All right, welcome. And Pamela, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Pamela Marino. Um, I'm with the City of Norfolk. I'm the um, Acting Director of Civic Lab, which is a small but mighty team of folks that we actually are housed in the Department of Budget and Strategic Planning, but our job is both internal and external. Internally, we're helping folks uh, get a hold of the tools and training to um, use data to make good decisions and also um, trying to train them to use data to tell their story. And then externally, we're working on um, transparency, um, improving community engagement through transparency, both through our open data portal and other dashboards, and also through some um, learning opportunities to get folks to understand how to use the data that's available to them. So thank you for having me. Very welcome. I've, we've got a few topics, subtopics within this idea of building data science capacity. And so I just want to pose a, a few questions to you. And after each of your answers, if the other has something that they feel dovetails or they want to do a follow-up question, let's, let's keep it casual and just ask each other as we see fit. So my first topic is this idea of establishing a long-term vision. When you build a data science team, you often can't accomplish it overnight over a month, or even within a single fiscal year. It's usually a long-term project. So there are several ways for it, several ways that you can reach your end goal. And different cities may have different end goals, which would make sense. Uh, my question for Kate is that in 2018, uh, the city of West Hollywood put out this smart city initiative, a strategic plan, pointing them in the right direction. And it established a sort of a long-term vision. And I wondered, what what problems or, or obstacles either that you saw then or that you anticipated having in the future was that smart city initiative responding to what was what was it trying to solve yeah so back in 2016 and 2017 the city council and the city manager in the city of west hollywood 
began to notice a shift in the kinds of capital improvement projects that were coming up on the docket and the types of projects that my team, the innovation team was working on. There was a lot more technology coming into our infrastructure, things like smart street lights, smart bus shelters, the expansion of our fiber network. Um, we had just purchased the street lights from Southern California Edison. And so we had this opportunity to look holistically at how we could transform the city into a place that not only functioned really well for our constituents, meaning high quality infrastructure, great traffic lights and street lights, good bus shelters, but also as a place that processed information and improved workflows internally so that operations were as seamless inside City Hall as people would experience out in the public. Um, that wasn't the case at the time. You know, we, we didn't put a lot of effort into um, data and technology before then. We certainly had an innovation team that was working on creative trainings for staff, design thinking trainings, getting staff ready to solve problems of the future. But we weren't looking at the whole city holistically. And so the Smart City Strategic Plan really gave us a roadmap to help determine what kind of infrastructure projects, smart city infrastructure projects were good, and then how to actually take all the data that comes from that infrastructure and data that was already being generated in City Hall and use it and analyze it to improve operations. Um, we saw a lot of technology coming to us, tech companies and infrastructure companies pitching projects to the city without a plan for how staff would use the data and turn that into actionable policy. So what's really the point of a smart city if you don't have smart city staff that can do something and, and make actionable change from all this new technology? That was the impetus then. We're, we're, it, it evolves over time. Uh, we continue to add new programs, but data is becoming a larger and larger focus of the Smart City Initiative. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question for Pamela that's uh, in a little different direction from this. So first, I just wanted to check in, see if you had any, uh, if, if you wanted to comment any on that one. Um, the only thing I that struck me, well, many things struck me in similarities, but definitely evolution is the name of the game. We did we sort of backed into it and i think you'll ask me a question that i'll talk some about it but um we did not have some grand scheme that this is exactly what we're going to do and we're going to start here and end here it's definitely um you have to be nimble and agile and flexible uh, because it definitely evolves for the better as you figure out what you need but um that really um, struck a chord with me and Pamela, as, as I mentioned, I, I want to keep exploring this idea of a long-term vision, but a, a, a related concept here is that at Civis, when clients come to us asking about how to increase their analytical maturity, we, we often say that it's not about solving any one thing. You can't, you can't just buy your way there with, with a big software contract. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a multi-front issue. So you have the data assets available to you, the culture in your workplace, network infrastructure, policies and guidelines. Uh, there's a whole lot of different things that all kind of have to, you know, move up in, in tandem with each other. Mm -hmm. So when you, as you've uh, tried to transform Norfolk's data science capacity, were there any things that you kind of consciously left for later because you felt that just when you were starting out, that was not the right time to tackle them? Um, yes, well, I would have to say that the culture change we knew was going to be the last thing that was going to come along. We were not going to be able to get out there and say, this is what you will do. You'll have this culture. Um, for a long time, we didn't really have what I call teeth. I mean, we just, I told everybody, we just had our delightful personalities that we went out to sort of beg people to play with us. Um, as we've grown in stature, 
um, and the city manager has signed on to the work that we're doing and encouraged it, um, it's easier to get stuff done. But in the beginning, it was just us saying, you know, please. Um, so what we did was built the built a structure that grabbed people from across the city. So we got as many people to have skin in the game. So we um, came up with, we, we already had an open data portal, but it wasn't really, we were just sort of playing around with it. So the first thing we did was get the council to uh, to vote on a um, wasn't an ordinance it was uh, just a a declaration which really doesn't have a lot of teeth but it just showed everybody that council was on board with what we were doing and the next thing we did that I think was really important was we formed three committees and they each had some power so we had an internal team that was made up of people throughout the city that sort of got together once a week and just talked about how we were going to move this this program forward. Uh, we put together a group of data champions, which are sort of mid-level folks that we offered data training to and told them how to do data stories and gave them um, different tools, um, especially Power BI. And then the third group was the Data Leadership Committee, which um, was department heads, and we gave them voting power because they were very afraid that we were going to grab hold of data sets and post them without any of their input. And so we basically uh, formed this committee that got to vote on data sets that we took forward. So there weren't many that they turned down, but it gave them a feeling of control. And, um, you know, three years later, they are our biggest advocates. Um, the final thing that we did was form civic lab so we were all the state internal team was spread all over the city some of us were in hr it finance um, budget doing various things with the data so we we brought them all together into one small team that basically leads this program so and and we're in the department of budget and strategic planning which if you can be in any department that's the one to be in because because they can open a lot of doors for you <laughs> So that's sort of, and now, now that we've gotten this far, now we are addressing culture. We've just uh, developed a data strategy, which we're going to take around. Um, we've got some ideas uh, for um, expanding our training. And um, so, so that's sort of, now we're addressing the culture part of it. All right. Thank you for that. Kate, any follow-ups you wanted to add? Um, you know, we're follow a similar path. I think the organizational change piece is, is the hardest part of it. Um, you know, we also did data trainings and um, in partnership with Civis and are now working with our executive team to really help define data sharing standards and, and guidelines for how best to share data across the organization. But, you know, our our plan in our Smart City Strategic Plan, of course, calls for having a full-time data lead. And I know we'll talk about that a bit later, but, um, you know, if, if you're just a small group of volunteers doing this, um, being realistic with what you can accomplish really helps set the, the playing field at a very even level for everyone involved and um sets the pace for change that segues very well into the next topic i want to talk about which is gaining traction so it's all it's all very well and good to have a long-term vision three five years or more but most of the people who come up with those plans can't move it forward unilaterally very few you know city state dictatorships here in, in america <laughs> So if you have to get buy-in from other people, you're talking about budget allocations, headcount, you know, people to hire up, uh, shifting job responsibilities, putting in new procedures that might impinge on, upon what people see as their job or their fiefdom. That can be a real struggle. Um, and I think my first question is for Pamela, uh, which is that I've got the impression that one of the sort of levers you used or, or uh, sort of a place to to get a foothold for analytics was the urgent the the pressing problem of residential flooding and roadway flooding in Norfolk's low-lying areas and saying that analytics transforming the analytics of the of the city could could be helpful uh, for that 
So could you talk a little bit more about your success or, or challenges in terms of using a narrow issue like that to perhaps push forward broader reform? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I watched your, your session previously and you showed the Civis tool, which is um, something that um, I actually didn't have, wasn't working on, but I'm so proud of what the city has done because it does tell the story in a way that nothing else can. Um, we have been struggling with um, resilience um, in our flooding since I've been with the city, which has been about 14, 15 years. And um, one of our, a couple of our folks that, that are now leading our resilience, we actually have a department of resilience, we're in IT um, playing around with the open data portal. And so we already had some folks in place that knew that connection. Uh, then we got some help from, uh, we became uh, affiliated with What Works Cities actually through a connection of uh, the Resilient 100 cities. And um, they actually then put us in touch with the Sunlight Foundation who helped us do something called a tactical data engagement. And what that was, was we brought together, we, we knew that resilience was an issue, that a big hot topic that we wanted to address. And so we brought people together from uh, the resilience community, which was, uh, you know, some Norfolk staffers, but we have a local university, Old Dominion University, that has a whole resilience department. So we had data scientists from there and data scientists from the Virginia Institute of Marine um, Science and local neighborhood leaders brought them all together uh, for a day long, basically brainstorming session to find out what we could do for them. What, what data were they not able to get a hold of that we could give them? And what they really wanted was um, the tide gauge data. We had tide gauges in place, but we weren't making that data on, um, available online. So uh, that took a, it took some time to get it done, to get the software in place, to get everybody in place. But now we have that data on our open data portal and updates every six, um, I think every six minutes. Um, and that really was a catalyst for us to do that one thing for the community and bring all those people together. That really sort of kicked the door open for us um, and showed how we could help in you know that we could help the community and um, internally as well. So definitely resilience has has been something that we have been able to grab hold of as a as a um, example of what can be done with with data and what improvements you can make with data. Kate. I kind of want to take this, I, I, I wonder if I can use West Hollywood as sort of a, not necessarily a counter example, but a place where I think it's being done a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. That this smart city strategic plan really envisioned a, a, a soup to nuts transformation um, that, that affects many different sectors or services that the city provides its residents. And I wonder what your experience has been in trying to gain traction uh, for something which is multi-issue, which which uh, pushes the ball forward on a lot of fronts simultaneously. Yeah, I mean, certainly resiliency is the name of the game in terms of getting anything done these days. Uh, if you can frame it as a resiliency issue, that is helpful. And I think, you know, for our climate action and adaptation plan, which is um, just about to be updated and adopted by the city council, you know, we, we haven't seen a flood in, in, you know, years here in Southern California. We would, we are um, concerned about things like heat impacts and of course earthquakes and, and all of that is um, tied to data. So I think going forward, our, the expansion of our program will greatly be tied to resiliency, but backing up to sort of where we began and how we envision transforming the city um, we are a small staff. There's only 215 or so full-time employees. Obviously, we're a small city. We don't necessitate a huge amount of uh, staff to do work, but we don't have anybody dedicated to data, although we do have an open data portal out of our IT team. We really envisioned, the Smart City Plan envisions a city in which every team has capacity to do their own data analytics. Mm -hmm. And because we're a contract city and so much of our work is done by external vendors, 
most of what we need to teach staff is really what is data? How do I recognize it? How do I request it? How can we give people tools like better procurement and contract language so that when we buy software or sign up for software subscription services, we ensure that the data is accessible to us in a easily downloadable or exportable <laughs> format and that we're not buying software that has proprietary data, even though it's our city data. Uh -huh. um, and so being able to build a framework that fits for the size and nature of our staff um that was important we knew that we weren't going to get five or six people to run a data team we knew that we had we're we're still hoping for one maybe a gis person at some point would be great um but we'll see how fast we rebound from the COVID pandemic um you know i think speaking of the pandemic and resiliency there's we're in a really good spot right now in the city of West Hollywood. We have a new city manager who believes deeply in performance management and is building an active performance management strategy inside the city. All of that is based on data. And I think what the pandemic did was show that you really can never have enough data. Um, you never know when the next disaster is going to strike. And, you know, if we had known that we would need every single piece of information about sidewalk width so we could be building outdoor dining areas and um, business license data so we could target you know, business relief and um, rental registries and rental data. Uh, all of you know, the, our COVID response was one that was based in data. And so, um, you know, with the transition out of the pandemic or into an endemic situation. Um, and as we recover, paired with a new city manager and the work we've already done with, with Civis and doing training for our staff, I think we're in a good place to begin really institutionalizing interest in data and, and um, growing our data capacity from just a group of 30 people that meets monthly to work through data challenges to something that, you know, now more than a quarter of our staff are trained. Um, can we get that up to half of our staff being trained? And can we start to see change in the way that we do policy and um, give information to the city council? Thanks, Kate. So, I had another topic about data assets and, and how you treat them, maintain them, where you place them, but uh, the two of your answers have already touched a little bit on that. And keeping in mind the time, I'd like to, to go to one last question I have for you, um, which is that long-term plans may outlast us or some of the people that we build them for. You know, They need to survive promotions, transfers, departures of key staff, stakeholders. And I'm wondering if either of you have recommendations on how cities can future-proof their analytics vision. Uh, and perhaps we can start with Pamela. Sure. Um, that is something that we've we've thought about because, you know, you get a new city manager or something will, you know, things definitely change. Um, I think a few things, putting a few things in place, uh, like Kate mentioned, uh, working with your procurement department to make sure that you can always grab hold of the data is really important because we've struggled with that, but now we have, we've overcome that. Um, the other thing that we're doing, because I, I think even a strategy sometimes can be tossed aside, a document, we are um, now working on coming up with a, what we're calling a certification program. So I mentioned earlier about the data champions that we have, which is a group of folks, um, just mid-level folks that we have sort of volunteered to join this group. But um, we don't have a big incentive for it. It's the people that are really interested in data. And so we want everybody to um, understand how to use data and the importance of it. And so we're, we're doing, um, we're, we're creating a program that basically certifies folks. It's a, it's a whole robust course of different different um, courses that they can take, starting with what is data, you know, how do you have clean data, you know, ending with um, how to use Power BI, and then finally a capstone project that will be something from their own department. And my plan is just to keep running as many people through this um, 
the good thing about government is people don't leave as often. Um, so you will have a core group of people that have been through this that have been taught the importance of data and how it can help you in your work and um, also how it can help you. To me, I'm a big believer in the power of data to explain your story. And, um, and you can't argue with data. So, you know, I think if people can learn, like if you have a problem, even if your data shows that you're not getting something done, it still tells the story, maybe that you don't have enough resources. So, you know, we're trying to just basically grow up all these mini data scientists that will, that will spread throughout the city and then resistance will be futile. That's our plan. <laughs> Thank you, Bella. I see that we've got to end of our time. Uh, I wish I could chat with the both of you for half an hour more. Uh, but I know there's another session keyed up right behind us. So I want to thank both of you. Oops. I'm sorry, I think I cut out. But uh, I really liked hearing from, from both of you about the challenges that your cities have been facing. And, um, you know, from Civis, best of luck. We'll be watching. Uh, we, we hope other cities look to you both as well for examples of how to progress uh, in building data analytics capacity. Mm -hmm.